Good evening. I'm Sam Holgood, Chancellor of the University of California, San Francisco. And I would like to thank all of you who are joining us uh, this evening. This is the third and final installment of a special three-part series of panel discussions commemorating the one-year anniversary of the declaration of COVID-19 as a global pandemic. The first two of these series are available online. The first discussion, we focused on the rapidly expanding body of scientific knowledge of the pandemic and of the virus itself. In our second panel, we discussed uh, the impact of the pandemic on the most vulnerable and underserved communities amongst us. And this evening, which promises to be very exciting, we will hear from experts about what comes next. Now, just over a year ago, the World Health Organization declared a pandemic and Bay Area public health officials issued shelter in place orders. Since then, COVID-19 has changed our lives and daily routines in way few other events have in our lifetimes. It is still very unclear how the usual rhythms of our lives will resume. While too many people are still getting infected and dying around the globe, we are seeing perhaps the beginning of the end of the pandemic. The increasing availability of vaccines means more and more people are beginning to resume familiar routines, to see their friends and families, to send their kids to school, and for those who had the option of working from home to consider a return to the workplace. So with a forward-looking perspective, the experts we have assembled tonight will discuss how the pandemic has changed us and also how we might return to what some describe as the new normal and what others have called the new future. Our experts will discuss amongst other topics how we may know when we're at the end of the pandemic, what the pandemic's long-term effects may be from trauma to the potential for greater attention on long-standing social inequities. The good and the bad of what the pandemic has exposed about our healthcare system and how it might change as a result. What our schools, workplaces and gatherings might look like in the next year. And importantly, how we can prepare for the next inevitable pandemic. So let's welcome the panel. I will introduce them briefly. Dr. George Rutherford is Professor of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at UCSF and is the Director of the Prevention and Public Health Group here. Dr. Margot Cushell is Professor of Medicine in the Division of General Internal Medicine at Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital and Trauma Center. Margot is also the Director of the UCSF F Center for Vulnerable Populations. Dr. Dana Long is a pediatrician and medical director for the Department of Community Health and Engagement at Benioff Children's Hospital, Oakland. Dr. Eric Goosby is a professor of medicine at UCSF and an internationally recognized expert on infectious disease. He has participated at the highest levels of government. And finally, Dr. Stefano Bertozzi, Professor of Health Policy and Dean Emeritus of the UC Berkeley School of Public Health. Joining these distinguished panel panelists and to moderate tonight's session, we have Dr. Bob Walker, Chair of the Department of Medicine at UCSF. So Bob, I'll hand over tonight's session to you. Thank you, Sam. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for the team who's put this together and thank you all for uh, taking the time to uh, join us. I am really looking forward to this session because uh, this is an all-star team, uh, an incredibly thoughtful group of people who will help guide us to, uh, to an uncertain future. It certainly has been a remarkable year and one that will have changed us all forever in ways that I think we only partly understand now and will only become clear uh, over time. Uh, there is a light at the end of the tunnel, but there still is a tunnel and we still have a ways to go. So don't take this conversation about the future as an indication that it is time to spike the ball. Uh, I've, I've, the analogy being, if you're running down the field 
and uh, and you spike the ball on the five yard line, that is a bad error. <laughs> so let's wait until we're in the end zone. But clearly we're moving in that direction. And it does seem an opportune time to begin thinking a little bit about the future and the ways this has changed us and, uh, and how the world will be different uh, in the future. Uh, David Axelrod uh, uh, once said, presidential campaigns are like MRIs of the soul. And uh, I think a pandemic is an MRI of the people and our organizations and our culture and our structures. And of course, we've learned a lot from that MRI and, and, and uh, some of the things we learned are, are, are hopeful and positive. Some of them are quite concerning, and, uh, but give us an opportunity to uh, have that exam and, and maybe change things for the better as we move into the next stage of all of our lives and the lives of our institutions. I also have to say that living in the Bay Area, uh, we did it remarkably well. Obviously, a lot of tragedy, a lot of deaths, a lot of hardships. Uh, and yet we still have not hit 500 deaths in the city of San Francisco. And if the country had mirrored our per capita death rate, there would be about 300,000 people alive today. So some of the things that we have succeeded in uh, also hold lessons for us as we go forward um, and maybe for the rest of the country and maybe for the rest of the world. So um, uh, we've been spending a lot of time this year talking about where we are and where we've been, but this will really be very future focusing. So. Uh, with that, let's go ahead and get into it. And uh, with uh, five panelists, uh, we won't have each one answer every question. And by the way, I want to ask the audience, uh, please, if you have questions, and I hope you do, uh, please type them into the Q&A box. We'll save 10 or 12 minutes at the end for, uh, for your questions. But uh, until then, uh, I will pepper the panelists with, uh, with questions. Uh, we're going to start with, uh, with the end of the pandemic. And uh, you know, the question seems to be coming up a lot. You know, when will it end, and what does that look like? You hear the, the word "normalish," which I'm not sure is in the dictionary, <laughs> seems to come up a lot. So, uh, since I have depended uh, on George Rutherford to teach me about where we are, uh, let's turn to George first and ask where we're going. When will we be out of this mess, and what does it look like to be out of this mess? Sure, and I guess if normalish is an adjective, normalicity would be the would be the noun, I guess. But exactly. you know, who knows? I, I think it's you know I think we're a ways away. Uh, frankly, just look at what's going on in Michigan and and in uh, New England, and you see uh, new outbreaks going on, probably with the B one 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 seven variant. Um, I, I think there's trouble ahead, uh, frankly. And I mean, I think we're pretty far down the line in California about having a, a fairly immune population. Um, if you, depends on what multiplier you wanna to use to move between cases and total infections, but if you use something fairly modest, like two and a half, and then take all the vaccines, we may have something like 40% of the population immune right now today. Um, so that's, you know, that's good, we're, 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 we're getting there. But again, the variants are of concern um, and ongoing transmissions uh, uh, of concern. And the more that there's ongoing transmission around the country, the more there's gonna be pressure here. Um, so I have to say, I'm a little, um, I think we're maybe at the 25 yard line, not the five. Really? And, and when people talk, so, so when do you see a return to something that resembles normal? Let's say resembles normal is people getting together inside uh, without masking, People going out to dinner inside without masking. People going to events, movies, theaters, those uh, sporting events uh, without masking. When when do you think that might happen? Oh, I think it, I think that could potentially happen uh, towards the mid middle to end of summer. But I'm not sure we're going to be able to stay there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let me ask uh, Steph to 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 weigh on on this. When you think of uh, normal or normalish. Uh, where do you think we are on our on our path? We can sort of move off the football analogies and some other metric, but where do you think we are and when do you think we, we get there and what does it look like to you? Well, I agree with what George has said. I think that um, certainly in California, it's, there's a very good chance that we're gonna have a brief honeymoon and then it will get uh, worse again. I wouldn't be surprised. I am afraid of variants. Um, I saw the reports from Manaus and Brazil with great concern because they were perhaps the most affected city in the world with the initial wild type of the virus. And now it appears that there's lots of reinfection with the new Brazilian variant. So I'm worried about what happens in the future. I'm worried as we increase vaccination that we will be applying selective pressure to the virus to develop vaccine escape mutants. And so um, there is a 
there is a future in which this goes on for much longer than we hope. Um, but the more important point I think is that I will feel that the epidemic, that the pandemic is over, not when it's over in Oakland where I live or San Francisco, but when it's over for everybody. And the optimism that I could feel at being vaccinated and having my mother and mother-in-law vaccinated and seeing that they are starting to be able to leave their confinement um, doesn't translate into what's happening for my friends in Mexico or in Zambia or in India. Um, the rest of the world is very far behind us. And for many people there, they're not even seeing the light yet. Mm -hmm. um, I'm hopeful that we will accelerate um, distribution, but I'm also worried about vaccine hesitancy. Um, the, the best news I have is I've been working with the prison system and we've had just shy of 50,000 infections in the prison system. And when I looked yesterday, we were down to 34 active cases and that's because of the magic of vaccination. So I think there is real optimism for what the vaccine can do for us. But I have said to the prison system, if the wrong variant comes in, the prison system could be equally vulnerable again. So we have to be very vigilant. And, and given kind of what we've seen in the last few months when variants first became, I, I'm sure it was a concern for you and George and others who follow this for a living, but for the rest of us that, that became uh, pandemic uh, pseudo experts over this past year, uh, is the variant story worse now than it was a couple of months ago, better now or the same? Uh, you know, you see the UK and cases coming down rapidly, coming down rapidly in South Africa, despite the variants and yet going up, as George mentioned, in Michigan and certain parts of Europe. So how do you judge how things have progressed over the last three months as we've been paying attention to variants? Well, I am optimistic um, because our vaccines seem to be pretty robust um, and pessimistic to think that selective pressure will then be applied and we might get variants that are vaccine escapes. I'm optimistic because I think at least the mRNA vaccines can be swapped in um, with, with variant protective um, uh, antigens quite quickly. And I would hope that like flu, those could be approved very quickly. So I run hot and cold on this, um, but uh, I'm pessimistic because it looks like some of the new variants don't do well with our existing monoclonal antibodies. And part of the reason that we've seen such phenomenally low mortality in the prisons is because of aggressive use of those. So. I'm worried about their durability. And I think that we need to be very actively um, evaluating new variants and making sure that we have monoclonals that are um, appropriately neutralizing. So I run hot and cold. And you I do, that was 50-50. I, count, I was <laughs> counting the optimisms and pessimism. That was, they were exactly equal. All right, great, thank you. Eric, let's turn to you, just uh, sort of weigh in on what you think the future holds for us in kind of big picture way. And you're on mute right now. I would agree with uh, George and Steph's uh, overviews. Um, I think that um, the uh, COVID outbreak, uh, as so many kind of public health insults do to populations, is they show you the uh, inequities in issues around access and retention. Uh, I think that the ability to benefit from the science we know is directly dependent on the ability uh, of the system to uh, responsibly successfully identify individuals. And I think that the COVID outbreak and the dialogue created in developed world settings around jurisdiction of response, who should orchestrate, who uh, should contribute, uh, who uh, was part of the overall testing, as well as the initial uh, emergency room and hospitalization response. It, as it always does, showed us where we are well interfaced with populations and where we are not. And I think those disparities in access and retention and benefit from the science that we understood uh, rapidly with natural history and pathophysiology over those early months of the outbreak um, have had disproportionate impacts and benefit. Uh, that, as Steph said, is much worse as you move uh, into uh, other, other countries and is poorly uh, surveyed. So our ability to know what the data is showing and what the experience really is, uh, is severely limited in some instances. 
and I think uh, makes it easy for us to uh, not engage because there's a lack of uh, data to hold our brains and eyes and ears to, uh, to, the, pro to the problem and to the task. I think that um, the biggest threat are the what these moving variants are going to uh, entrench or not. Uh, it's a race with vaccination, uh, especially in those populations that can be most uh, harmed from it. Uh, elderly populations, comorbidities, et cetera. We've talked about uh, minority disproportionate representation in that. Uh, and I think those differences are essentially staying with us as we try to um, uh, 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 weigh uh, the delivery system's ability to get to those entrenched populations that historically uh, don't reveal themselves to, uh, to the system. And I think that this has challenged all of that. So with all of those variables not being easily modeled, uh, I think there are a number of scenarios that we could uh, see uh, late summer, fall, uh, in the best uh, calculations with rapid uh, uh, and continued acceleration of, immune, of, of the vaccination efforts, uh, already starting with higher risk populations, if that continues, if we continue to work on um, expanding that cooperation in who's responsible for the response, uh, not let it stop now, but continue uh, to uh, understand and make those orchestrating decisions as medical delivery systems have to work across each other and together. So I think late summer, early fall, uh, if everything goes well. If not, I think we're going to have to uh, see, understand, and respond uh, through the summer months as we've been doing. Yeah, thank you. Um, maybe, Dana, let, let's, let's switch gears a little bit to the problems that were exposed by the pandemic. Obviously, they were not problems that were, they were problems that were clearly there and were entrenched. But they include inequities, they include poverty, they include social determinants and socioeconomic determinants of health. As you look at the future, and let's say we are coming out of this thing in, uh, uh, in the summer or the fall or early next year, and we've heard all the caveats about whether we will be or won't be, but let's assume we are. What do you think the impact of the pandemic will have been on that? And you hear a lot of lip service about addressing them in new ways. How much of that do you think is, is real? Thank you so much for the question, um, Bob. And our exposure and experience to COVID really demands that we have conversations around adversity, trauma, and inequity. When we think about what do we mean when we say trauma, we think back to the initial adverse childhood experience study that was conducted in the mid 1990s, which highlighted the relationship between abuse, neglect, household challenges, and the dose dependent exposure to toxic stress, which leads to poor health outcomes across the board. Whether those are physical health outcomes, such as cancer, diabetes, obesity, behavioral or mental health outcomes, um, increased suicidal ideation and attempts, um, use of substances. We also now recognize that, as you said, the social determinants of health or related life events, such as food insecurity or housing instability, exposure to discrimination, are also correlated with a risk for toxic stress and have biologic pathways that lead to poor health outcomes. The COVID pandemic has really sort of shattered um, this notion that we are an equitable society as we see higher morbidity and mortality amongst people of color, black and brown people. My hope is that our path forward is really allowing us to have hard conversations about structural inequities that lead to these related life events, um, such as poverty and inequality. The best way for me to illustrate this is actually to share a story. Um, as schools are reopening, certainly across our local counties, I was driving my three sons to school and we were at an intersection and 
as we were crossing the intersection, there was a police car um, and there was a white father and his two daughters gleefully walking to school with masks on. These, these young girls were waving at this police officer as they walked by. And I recognized how differently I am parenting my son such that myself and my black sons in my car, I was not making eye contact, hoping that we were invisible, knowing that I would throw my, throw my body sort of in harm's way for them. As we think about the path forward, I think that I hope that my grandchildren or my great grandchildren can actually walk gleefully across the path of a police officer without fearing um, fear, yeah. right? Yeah. And so our path forward, we have a lot of work to do, but certainly having hard conversations and recognizing inequities is the first step. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And I have to say that, you know, that this past year has made me much more aware of that stories like that. And I think that's, that's, that's progress. Uh, doesn't fix it, but I think it's important that we've all woken up to that in a way that uh, many of us were not before. Margo, the, uh, you know, the problem of homelessness uh, existed before in a major way, had a sort of different uh, variations during the pandemic, obviously tremendous fear that the homeless population would be uh, unduly harmed and to some extent maybe they were, uh, but also shown a light on that population and that set of problems. And uh, I'll embarrass you by saying, I think you're now the national expert on <laughs> issues of homelessness and the science of it. And how do we, you know, how do we use evidence to try to make it better? Uh, what did we learn? And uh, did you, do you come out of this, assuming we're coming out of it, with more hope that we will come up with real and durable and, and, and uh, with solutions that work? I mean, I think if, if the COVID pandemic was at MRI, um, I think in some ways it exposed the big rotting cancer at the heart of our of our country, um, you know, how racism, how, um, how income inequality has really um, driven in, in a lot of ways this pandemic. And I think so, I think there are a few take homes. One is that homelessness we've always said is a tip of the iceberg. And I think this pandemic showed us what's right beneath the surface. I know I was on one of your grand rounds pretty early in the pandemic, probably mid April where I said, this pandemic is a story of essential workers living in overcrowded housing. Um, and it has in fact been that story. You know, For the first few months of the pandemic, I called all the patients in our clinic who were impacted by COVID. I did have one conversation in English. Every conversation was in Spanish. And as I was taking down the names of the people in the household to do co early contact tracing, you know, we're talking about you have one bathroom. And as I got to name 14, 15 in the household, I thought, oh my God, I'm a housing researcher. This is all I think about. And this is a horror story. And, and that is why, for instance, in the Bay Area, we've seen such disproportionate impact in our Latinx population. Those populations don't show up in our homeless numbers. In some ways, their homelessness presents differently. They're living 14 or 15 people um, into a small apartment, which is the only way that they can afford um, to work here. And ironically, of course, they were doing the essential work that we deemed too essential to stay home. I think when you talked about the homeless population, you know, some of us in the field have been saying for years that keeping people who experience homelessness, first of all, that, you know, my tagline is there's no medicine as powerful as housing, because it's so impossible to keep people safe when they're homeless. It's just the worst possible thing you could think of. We've said for years, keeping people in large congregate shelters is not the answer. It's breathtakingly expensive. I was just looking at some numbers for the city and looking at the staffing because we've been doing testing in the shelters of staffing and the clients and there were almost as many staff as there were clients. And you think, what are we doing? Like, what are we doing? Why don't we just spend this money to give people a place to live? I think the pandemic has shown quite how dangerous it is to be homeless. You know, when we had that first um, break outbreak in the big shelter in San Francisco, where we had about a 75 or 80% penetrance rate, it made the case that we've been trying to make for years really clearly that big mass shelters are not a safe place for any person. 
you've seen some promising things. You know, we acted really quickly and got Project Roomkey off the ground, where we moved about 15,000 people into non-congregate shelter, into hotel rooms, and really kept them safe. And that is probably the reason why in California we didn't have the mass um, crisis and homelessness as we feared. So I think there's a little bit of a path forward. The question is, you know, can we get the political will to make these changes? Can we see beneath the tip of the iceberg and realize that we can't have a healthy economy with a million housing units short that we have in California for our extremely low income households? Um, and what do we need to do to change it? The fact that the Recovery Act has so much money in it for rental assistance is a really good sign and hopefully will be proof of concept. The amount of money it would take to house all Americans is a rounding error for the federal government. We just have never been able to get people interested in it, and there's such an intersection with racism. So if there's a glimmer of hope, is that it's easier for us to make the case that we've been trying to make for years. Let me ask you, thank you. Well, let me ask you about one more vulnerable population that maybe hasn't gotten the same emphasis, and you run the Center for a Vulnerable Population, so this is in, it, it, it's, it's in your bailiwick, uh, which, is, which is elders. Yeah. And we've talked about, we'll, we'll talk about kids already, we talked about uh, people who are homeless. We've talked about communities of color, poverty, but the biggest toll was on, was on older folks. So how, how do you think about that? And is that getting, it feels like some of these other populations are getting a lot of attention. It, it feels like the moment maybe because of the, the other issues around race in the United States, but do you feel like we're providing, we're giving enough attention to issues around older, older people? Clearly older people were, um, disproportionately impacted and, and, and even more specifically, particularly older people in nursing homes. And then to be even more specific, I think one of the most important finding was a difference in your chance of dying if you're an older person in a nursing home funded by you know, Medicaid as opposed to, um, as opposed to a, a fancier nursing home. Um, if you were in a nursing home um, for basically indigent people, your chance of surviving was so much lower. Um, no question that older adults, um, you know, because of their physiology, um, uh, you know, were at more risk of dying if they got the infection. But because of the way that we treat so many of our elders, um, we're really at more risk of acquiring the infection, you know, likewise. And so I think it does shine a light. First of all, how, you know, just within healthcare, how little attention we give to our elders um, proportionally, how, you know, the mass shortage of sort of geriatricians and geriatric knowledge. And, you know, I credit like our colleague Louise Aronson for talking about elderhood. We talk about childhood so much, but why don't we talk in the same way about elderhood? But I think, um, I think once again, it's, it did not hit all elders equally. Um, and certainly if you were a low income elder in an understaffed, underfunded nursing home, you were at even higher risk. So yes, we need a lot more attention to elders um, and how we keep people healthy, but we also need to um, be sure that we are um, treating everybody no matter what their socioeconomic background with, um, with safety you know, and the opportunity to thrive. Great, thank you. Uh, let's turn to kids for a second, and um, and then I want to turn to sort of other uh, other long term prognoses for uh, for the workplace and society more generally. But uh, sort of one more specific population, and uh, this will be probably George and Dana. Uh, people forget George is such a crack epidemiologist; they forget he's a pediatrician by training. So I'll remind them. Um, George, uh, tell us about the schools. What did we get wrong? What did we get right? And what does the future portend for education? Does education change in any fundamental way based on our experience over the past year? I think education is pretty... I, so what did we get wrong? Basically everything. Um, what did we get right? Basically nothing. Um, if, we, if we did this again, we would have kept the schools open. But I'd have to say at the time, the playbook for for pandemic influenza says the first thing you do is close the elementary schools because they're huge huge incubators for um, uh, for uh, for influenza A, um, and there are fabulous studies that have shown that have shown this. So you know, I mean, that's kind of what we were left with to start with. I, I think we probably, if we could had got, had gotten it together a little bit better, we could have might have been able to go back to school in the fall like a lot of places did, um, but. It's uh, you know it's been a real problem. I, I think that we'll let see. Me, let me just highlight your answer there. I just want to, so folks are clear. We got it wrong, you say, but you say basically 
we got it wrong because of the historical precedent from flu. Yeah. It wasn't necessarily a wrong thing at the time. It just turned out that COVID was tr different than the yeah. flu. We didn't know that. Once we knew that, we should have pivoted much, much more quickly. Is that well, a fair yeah. interpretation? Yeah, I think that's fair. Yeah, I mean, I, it was still wrong. Yeah, but it's, <laughs> but, it's <laughs> but we didn't we didn't the know right the decision. Fact. But you know, yeah, but I, I get it. Okay. I, um, and, and you know, by the time there were early data that came out from, say, that there was a big survey in Iceland, for instance. Iceland, by the way, is the size of Marin County, so you don't want to place too much money on this one. But you know, some of the early data from uh, from child from children from China and from some of these other studies, I mean, I think they really pointed the way that said we could have we might have been able to uh, push on this earlier and and reversed course. I don't know what the longer term impacts on education are going to be. I would hope that they're we're resilient enough. Um, that we'll be able to return to normal. That's going to take a pediatric vaccine. It's certainly going to take adolescent vaccines. Um, but I, I think it'll be a, a good year from now before it's really, really recovered. Okay. And Dana, you've been taking care of these kids and dealing with the situation the whole year. Tell us what the impact has been and then what you think, how, how does the future of schools change and, and what is it going to do to these kids that lived through this past year? The the effects of school closure on our children we've seen in my lifetime certainly an unprecedented unprecedented number of unvaccinated kids at this point um, because kids are not often in daycare or um, having those kindergarten physicals we have seen a number of, i've seen a number of one-year-olds that never got their two four six month vaccines i've seen four-year-olds that are now five that never got mmr never got varicella never got their um, polio booster and we are now having to play catch up um, to an entire cohort of children who are um, potentially could be exposed to these what are vaccine preventable illnesses we also have seen children not passing their developmental screens because they haven't had the social interaction with other kids where they learn such basic life skills like how to share, how to work in groups. Um, we have seen physical consequences such that we have some of the highest rates of kids that are now pre-diabetic or diabetic, secondary to the fact that they're not getting out there and exercising. We also are very concerned about our children's mental health in terms of their anxiety and social isolation. Um, really not knowing how to have conversations with their peers anymore in in-person settings. And I also wanna talk about another vulnerable population and that's our kids with special needs. I've had kids who are on the autism spectrum or who have developmental delays who haven't been getting their resources because their schools have been closed. And these resources range from needing IEPs, individualized education plans to occupational therapy or speech therapy. And it's been challenging. Thank you, yeah, terrible. Uh, Steph, let me, let's turn a little bit to the healthcare system. So this tested the healthcare system. Uh, first of all, how do you think the healthcare system did? And what do you think the enduring changes will be to the healthcare system coming, coming out of this once we enter normal-ish? Well, I think that some of the changes are obviously the same um, types of changes that happened with the educational system. And that is that we were dragged almost overnight from an in-person world into a virtual world. And um, much of that is bad in the short term, meaning it made medical care more difficult and less good and bad educationally because it left lots of people in the lurch who didn't have access to good internet and et cetera. But in the long term, I think they will both be positive changes because everybody now understands how these tools can be used and in many cases, they will be used in a way that will now decrease inequities rather than increasing inequities as, we, as we've seen in both education and health. I was surprised when I spoke to a federally qualified health center the other day to, to learn how much of a difference there was in terms of the proportion of their remote visits that were um, video versus non-video. And the reason I was surprised was because even in the FQHC uh, patient population, the penetration of smartphones is very high. And it's, we're not talking about the situation that we see in many developing countries. 
but it turns out that there are many additional steps that are required to make your smart smartphone usable in a video visit that I hadn't thought through. I mean, it would have been obvious if I'd thought about it, but I, but I hadn't. And so uh, at the same time, you know, this is a glass half full, half empty. I do see that some of those changes will be very important going forward. Now, why don't I let somebody else chime in? Because of course, there are all kinds of system issues that, that have been highlighted by, by this as well. Yeah, anybody wanna add anything to that? I would just very briefly um, speak to the frustration in the early months of the response in um, convening a group of providers and third-party payers um, uh, that were uh, the predominant um, healthcare delivery system for the city of San Francisco, but the private sector having uh, a very low self-perception of their role in responding to a public health threat. Uh, the initial discussions were, we don't feel we should have anything to do with testing. Uh, we will, you know, what are you talking to us about that for? Um, and then I think re retreating to a internal discussion, all of them came back, but it took two to three months before they really committed and were actually part of the thinking to put capability in place. I fear that that um, insensitivity, lack of awareness that we see in public-private disparities throughout the United States and developing settings in Europe um, and throughout the world uh, will persist because there's no real incentive for people to drop profit margins to allow for uh, resources to go toward public sector activity. If it ever can happen, if COVID can't move that discussion, I don't know what else can. Mm -hmm. A concentrated, truncated onslaught of unmet need in a context of trying to understand in real time the natural history and pathophysiology of a new disease, but not having the luxury of being able to just watch it. What occurred in HIV over a, um, really uh, a 15 year period occurred in the first four or five months of the outbreak with COVID. Uh, and our need to know uh, really paralleled that same evolution in HIV. But my biggest fear, Bob, is, is, the, uh, is the persistent display of insensitivity and preservation of profit driven um, decision making for private public interfacing with healthcare delivery systems. It's a huge need. The Biden administration gets it intellectually, but they don't have the mass action power to move private sector discussion into an honest exchange. Yeah. But I believe it's our biggest, our biggest threat to be able to address disparities that run down racial and socioeconomic lines. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll tag on one little piece and it, it sort of gets at Steph's answer, but maybe takes it a step further, which is that um, the, the uh, amount of the pivot to virtual care was remarkable. UCSF over the last five, 10 years, we've been a leader in telemedicine. We went from 1% to 2% televisits and that made us a leader. We went to 70% in the month of March, 2020 and we're down to about 40 to 50%. We're still doing a ton of it. And although a televisit is simply at some level just a replacement of a regular visit, maybe a little bit more convenient, it also opens up a path for access to populations that didn't have access before. It also opens a path to really change the dynamics of the healthcare system in, in interesting ways that we'll have to see. You know, in the old days, when Mayo Clinic said we want to have a presence beyond Minnesota, they needed to buy or build hospitals in Arizona or Florida, and UCSF the same. And now the possibility of national brands, for better or worse, you know, you'll have to decide if you think Amazon is a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, but uh, you know, for better or worse, there will be national brands in healthcare. There will be more consumer sort of focused healthcare where people do more stuff in their home, in their workplace, uh, and you know, it will be very different. And that all would have happened over twenty years, and I think it'll happen over five because of COVID. So it 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 really uh, quickened the pace of evolution. I just want to jump in here and, and talk about how the practice of medicine has shifted um, through the benefits of technology and say that 
For many of our patient populations, telehealth has been an amazing way for us to stay connected. Um, our adolescents, they actually love digital health. And I have found that I have been able to remain closer to my teenage patients, many of whom have been having issues of anxiety or depression or social isolation in ways that I wouldn't have been able to without this um, pivot to telehealth. And our FQHC has been remarkable in supporting providers and our patients to stay connected. And do you see, as you've been doing these visits, uh, Dana, is there a downside to connecting with your patients through telehealth? You know, what, what are you missing? Because we, you know, prior, the only the reason we went to 2% was partly regulatory barriers, partly payment barriers, partly patient barriers, but partly clinicians saying, I can't do that. I need to touch my patient and have them in the room and make eye contact and all that kind of good stuff. So what's been the pluses and minuses of doing visits this way? We have been able to create relationships with our patients in ways that we weren't. There is a certain amount of intimacy that we're able to have with our families by being in the room. It is like a virtual home visit. And mm. you can see baby and mom and grandmother all at the same time. And that has been sustaining and that has helped us to build resilience. Interesting. Now, on the other hand, it's hard sometimes to diagnose rashes, right? Like virtually. And there are times when you need to actually see something in person. Um, and we also have populations that really prefer to come into clinic. And so it's not a cure all, but I definitely think that telehealth needs to stay as we are sort of on this path forward to um, thinking about what our new normal is. Great, thank you. Margo, did you wanna add something? I mean, I think, you know, I think there's tremendous potential here and you saw some regulatory changes quickly, for instance, for people, for treatment for people who are substance users, where so many of the regulations were effectively punitive. You know, you have to come in every day and suddenly we realized you didn't actually need to do that. You know, that we could do more home-based opioid replacement therapy. I do want to just um, maybe lift up, though, the idea that I'm worried, again, that we could just be replicating inequality here, or there's a real risk of replicating the inequality here. Um, because, you know, in, in my clinic, I haven't done one visit by video. I've done 90% of visits by, um, you know, we've done a huge percent of our visits by tele, but it's by phone. There's a big difference between a phone and a video visit. And amongst older, impoverished people, video visits are not happening. Um, we don't have the technology terribly well in our clinic, but mostly our um, patients don't have that. And so, you know, I just, I just, while we get all enthusiastic about it, it would be a great irony of COVID, which has shown so many of our disparities if we just replicate those without actually, um, you know, making sure that we do the work that we need to do, because the potential is enormous of what we could accomplish. Great, thank you. Maybe this will be my last question, then I'm gonna to turn to Jason Alvarez to ask some of the uh, audience questions. Uh, and this, maybe I'll start with Eric, but we'll, we'll go maybe around, around the horn on it. Um, we're gonna come out of this at some point. Still trying to decide whether Steph leaned on the optimism or pessimism more, but uh, at some point we'll come out of this. What does this teach us about preparing for the next pandemic? And what is your level of confidence that we will get it right, or maybe not right, but righter next time. Uh, you know, and who, who knows when it'll be, but it, we will have something. So, Eric, you've you've thought a lot about pandemics. You were on uh, on the president's advisory group uh, when he was president elect, helping to advise him. I know they were thinking not only about this, but about preparing for the future as well. So, what are your thoughts? I think that um, it has, uh, I think, galvanized a commitment to. Uh, institutionalized pandemic planning. Uh, the link to security seems to be uh, Biden's preference. So they're linking it more to uh, a, a security threat and thinking of it kind of in tandem with that. Um, I think that- uh, when, when, when you say, Eric, when you say security threat, just so I'm clear, do you mean that you know we prepare a lot for a war and therefore we should prepare a lot for this? or that this is likely to be bioterrorism that's going to be coming at us because another country did something? Um, the, the threat to society and the economy uh, is of the level that a, uh, a terrorist threat 
could be or a security threat could be. So it one, it's one that goes across the societal touchstones. Thank you. And, uh, and it also is a different management approach in the White House and the State Department. A decision to put it in a security context brings an entirely different group of people to each meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, and you have the ability to uh, have the military understand and be part of your deployment cachet. Mm -hmm. uh, and they see themselves as being part of that. If there's a security somewhere in the title of the activity, if there isn't, it's HHS's problem right. and they don't want to deploy their resources. And I assume, and, they, I assume calling it security bumps up the budget as well. But bumps up the budget and uh, the uh, rapid response capability. Got it. Um, but, but I think that, Bob, that the discussion globally has not paralleled uh, this enough. Uh, the uh, weakness of WHO to play the role of convener and have a similar discussion that's occurring in the United States and most other countries uh, to carry that to countries where this conversation is not happening, where mobilization of resources at government levels uh, either lag way behind or have not even prioritized the COVID threat as, uh, as something they need to put budget toward. Yeah. Uh, and I think um, you see every strategy on part of leadership presidents in particular to explain why they don't need to engage. And you see that with every pandemic. Yeah. HIV, TB are by no means uh, excluded from that. All right, thank you. Uh, maybe Steph, I'll go to you next and then maybe close with George on this. And then I want to be sure we have time for some audience Q&A. So we're, we're, how do you think we're going to do on preparedness? And also, is this the sort of thing that, OK, three years from now, we're good. But seven or eight years from now, this budget inevitably gets pilfered because it's just sitting there and waiting for somebody to dip into it for something else that seems like a more urgent, acute priority. So I'm going to be plus and minus on this one too, right. <laughs> forgive me. <laughs> but um, I'm amazed by how well the countries did who had previously experienced SARS. They understood how serious this was. They took it seriously. They did the right thing and they shut it down. And um, we need to learn from what those countries did. My son-in-law is from New Zealand. His friends were going to music festivals while we were entering our second wave. I mean, it's just, they, they lived a different year than we did. At the same time, and I've said this to Eric, if this isn't the time to radically reform WHO, yeah. I don't think people realize that the World Health Organization mm -hmm. has a budget much smaller than that of UCSFs, and yet it's responsible for the world. If this isn't the time to take seriously the global infrastructure that's needed to rapidly and effectively respond to this kind of a threat, we will never do it. And I'm pessimistic because I've been at the process of trying to get the world to realize how much we need that global infrastructure for too long, that I can't let myself be optimistic, but I'm certainly as optimistic as I've ever been. Um, and I'm hopeful that with the new administration putting serious muscle behind it and like-minded folks in a few other countries, um, I think this is a, the time to make that happen, but I. I won't say I expect it to happen. I just hope that it will happen. Thank you. All right, George, I'll give you the last word on this and we'll turn to some audience questions. You're on, you're on mute. Sorry, sorry, I actually know how to do this, Bob, don't worry. <laughs> After a year, if we don't know how to unmute ourselves, we got a big problem. I mean, I don't think people realize that we had this elaborate uh, early warning system that USAID defunded in October of, uh, of 2019, including one based at the Wuhan Institute of Technology whose sole job was to say, study beta coronaviruses and bats. Now, if you talk about good, good decision-making, that, you know, that has to rank towards the bottom all, all time. Um, but anyway, I, I'll, why don't we go to the questions? It'll be, I think, a lot more enlightening than me. <laughs> right. The all right, so let me turn it over to, uh, to Jason Alvarez, uh, who's been mining the audience questions. And uh, Jason, it's all yours. Thank you. Um, I have some questions for our pediatricians. George or Dana, do you have any idea when a pediatric vaccine will become available? And what are your thoughts on the age at which a child should be vaccinated? Dana, please. So 
I have exciting news and that is within our Fairly Qualified Health Center as part of UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital in Oakland, we actually are now starting to vaccinate kids um, who, are the eight, who are 16 and up who have chronic health conditions. And um, these chronic health conditions range from um, being morbidly obese to having an immunosupp any kind of immunosuppressed um, system. Be, once we get below the age of 16, as you all know, the studies have not yet been done for younger children. Um, there are many sites that are participating in pediatric trials and goodness, I hope that the vaccine is ready for kids by the summer, but I honestly don't know the date. Yeah, I, I'd say the adolescent one which would probably be approved by early summer. The young one for younger children is going to take quite a bit longer, probably until the end of the fall. Just, just guessing. They're trying uh, not to George. include, um, uh, you know, it's looking at safety and immunogenicity and not, you it's know, okay. right, everything else. So it, it should, it should be in that time frame. Everyone feels it will. I have a question for George. A follow up to a statement you made. You mentioned that we got it wrong by closing schools. Yeah. Would the teachers have been put at major risk by schools staying open, though, especially teachers in high schools? Unlikely. Unlikely. I mean, high schools are a different beast, but elementary schools is what I was really talking about. I'm sorry. I, I don't think so. Uh, I don't think the teachers would have been at any more particular, more risk than, um, than others, um, than other essential workers. Now, that, this is all assuming that they wore masks and they ventilated and, you know, in, in 1918, 1919, and uh, Boston and New York moved their, their public schools outdoors for the whole time. Um, so we would have had to have done things like that. But, uh, you know, I think we could have, I think we could have soldiered through this a little bit better. Great. Uh, I have a question for Margo. Margo, the state of California and many other states don't keep accurate and current data about vaccine administration by race, poverty, and other social determinants of health. How can we manage, how can we manage what we don't measure? Yeah, it's a huge problem. I mean, we are supposed to report on um, on some of those issues, um, but they haven't been uh, they haven't been fully reported on. And I I tend to think when they're not reported on, when people don't report, it's usually not good news in terms of equity. You know, I think no news is not good news here. And I think that we have reason to believe that um, that we have not done a good job. I heard today. I think we were in uh, third to last place in terms of equity equitable distribution of vaccines, which is really, um, which is really terrible. And so I think the answer is absolutely, you have to measure it and, and then you have to quickly address it, both because it's the morally right thing to do, um, because it is the only equitable response, and frankly, because it's going to get us out of the pandemic faster as well. Thank you. I have a, another question that I think should be directed to you. Has COVID exacerbated the digital divide or does it create pressure to find ways around bridging that gap? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it has um, exacerbated um, the digital divide. You know, it was it was hard enough um, to practice medicine where my patients needed to take three buses to get to me where they weren't paid. You know, they, they lost work pay to come to my visits. That was all hard. Um, but when we suddenly had to go... Um, go digital or go to telehealth, we just lost a lot of people that just became impossible um, to reach. And so I think that's why, you know, as we're pouring money into digital health, we need to be pouring money and resources into digital health equity. I think there's enormous potential there, right? If people don't have to take three buses, you know, for me to adjust someone's blood pressure medicine, if I can get them a blood pressure machine at home and coach them over the home and they don't have to lose a half day of work, that would be fantastic. But it's not going to happen. Nothing like this happens just by like wishing it or happens. It needs to be um, thoughtful. There need to be resources put towards it. Um, and I think if we don't do that, we will exacerbate it. And I'll, I'll add that, that you know, I spent a fair amount of time with Silicon Valley companies and they now get that in a way that was different than two years ago. And so whether the funding will be there to distribute, to distribute the devices or pay for them, and whether insurance companies will recognize that it's cost effective for Margot's patient to be able to manage his or her blood pressure from, from home, that's an unclear question. But they are thinking about the, the creation of these devices 
in ways that you turn it on. And again, we've got to figure out the internet connections, but in a way that you turn it on and it's sort of like a modern defibrillator. You really don't have to read the instructions. You don't have to be an internet genius to, to make the thing work. And I think that's actually a positive development in the last couple of years. And you wonder, Bob, if we shouldn't be thinking about Wi-Fi the way we think about other public goods. I mean, I think we're at this point in this world where in this country, you know, we saw it with the schools, right? That like I know in my district, they had to go around and, and park vans and portable Wi-Fi because so many households didn't have Wi-Fi. I think that that seems like um, low hanging fruit that we maybe as, as we move into a digital world, if we want equity, we need to, we need to make things like Wi-Fi, um, you know, free for everybody and available. Uh, one other positive is that I worked in what was then Zaire, now the Congo, when the internet gave us access to the Harvard Medical Library from Kinshasa, and it was transformational. I did that for the whole world, and it was just magic that we suddenly had access to information. Now, with so much of education having been forced into the digital space, imagine what it can do for education, for higher education in particular, uh, in terms of democratizing access. So I think that there, there's real potential upsides with all the caveats that Margot has said, but um, uh, you know, I think that we have an opportunity here too. Great, thank you. I have another question. This one I think is directed to uh, Stefano. Can you speak more about selective pressure for new variants through vaccination? How does that work? And doesn't reducing the transmission rate reduce the rate of mutation? can't tell if you didn't or did like my written response. <laughs> <laughs> so what I said was, of course, um, if we could vaccinate everybody really quickly, that would reduce um, the, the likelihood of variants emerging. But what we're doing is slowly vaccinating people across the world. And what that means is that there are lots of people being vaccinated in communities where there's active transmission and active exposure. So people are getting exposed and infected when they've just been vaccinated, when there's a little bit of selective pressure on the, on the virus, but not enough to shut it down. So that creates an environment during those weeks where you will have selective pressure. In addition to that, we're vaccinating some people who don't mount a, a sufficiently good response to the vaccine, whether they're immunocompromised or the elderly or anybody who, for whatever reason, they didn't get a proper dose, it was injected into fat, you know, who knows. And those people can also have a partial response, but not one that's enough to shut down the infection. And they can also be people who um, help to speed the emergence of variants. So it's something that I worry about. And it's this race. I think of it like an up escalator and a down escalator. You know, can we shut it down quick enough? Um, so that we can really get ahead of this, or will it end up emerging and um, coming back to bite us again? Thank you. I have a question for Eric. Uh, do you foresee meaningful steps being taken internationally to reduce the likelihood of future zoonotic diseases emerging? Um, I share the uh, fear that uh, this pressure and need has been there my entire professional life, but we have not seen a meaningful response to expand the capacity. So I remain with that skepticism. But again, echoing what Steph just said, there has never been a time when the discussion has been more robust, nor when there has been a more ubiquitous example of disparity creating differences in healthcare delivery systems globally. So, and I think it's gonna crescendo over the next few months toward the summer. So I believe the ground is fertile for that discussion to happen. The leadership is not clearly in place to carry it out. Thank you. Um, I have a question for George. George, one of our audience members read an article in the Washington Post that some long haul COVID patients have had symptoms that subside after getting vaccinated. Is there any research on this? Uh, with their case reports, and I think it's the sort of thing that's easily can easily be examined in a randomized control trial and get it answered once and for all. Thank you. And one final question for Bob. Bob, if you had a billion dollars to spend on helping to end the pandemic, what would you spend it on? <laughs> Uh, well, we do. I mean, we have more than that in the in, in the current package that was just that was just uh, uh, passed by Congress and signed by the president. Um, the key thing we're going to toggle in about two to four weeks from not enough vaccine to not enough arms. And so the question will be, can we get people to be vaccinated? 
uh, to want to be vaccinated. Um, and so I'd spend it on that. And uh, having spoken to some of the administration people about this matter, you kind of wonder why are they not rolling out public service announcement campaigns and, th and smart ones. It's not just did Dr. Fauci get the vaccine. It is do, do the religious leaders in your community get the vaccine? Do the teachers, do, uh, do your favorite sports star, does your favorite TikTok skateboard guy or woman get the vaccine? The answer is they are actually doing all that. They, have, they are spending a billion dollars on that. They don't want to roll that out until there is enough vaccine. They think if they roll it out too soon, it'll just frustrate people. So I think you're going to start seeing that in the next few weeks, and that will become the dominant issue. I would say the, the I don't know whether it's a question of money or a question of politics and ethics, but the issue of vaccine passports or immunity passports, I'm not sure I'd spend a million or a billion dollars on it, but I would really want to think hard about that. Like, is that a reasonable strategy to insist that people show evidence of vaccination before they get access to name your favorite place, the schools, the sports stadium, the movie theater, the supermarket? And um, as you know, Israel is doing it. I think it's an incredibly interesting and complicated question at every level, uh, levels of equity, legality, ethics, policy. But figuring that one out and whether it's a good idea. And if it is a good idea in certain circumstances, getting the databases set up in a way so it's actually truthful. We actually have real evidence. My little two by four piece of, of cardboard that I was given that says CDC on it is not gonna be good enough to go. I think that's gonna be an important uh, issue to try to sort out. But the main issue that I would spend money on is on vaccine hesitancy. And also, I guess important to add, what we've learned is on, among communities of color, the rate of people saying I want the vaccine is now comparable to the Caucasian population, and yet the vaccination rate is lower. So you don't want to be spending all the money on convincing people to get the vaccine. You also want to be sure that they have access to it in ways that are uh, appropriate and equitable so that people who want to get it can get it as easily as possible. So I'd be spending a lot of resources on that. I think I, I, I have already spent the billion. I might be, I might be on my second billion by now. Bob, to illustrate your point, in the California prison system, where the vaccines have been incredibly effective, they're the most dangerous place to be in the country uh, in terms of likelihood of becoming infected with COVID. And about half of the staff in the prisons has refused vaccination. Interesting. Uh, much higher acceptance rate among the residents of our prisons. Yeah. So that, for me, was a shocking number. Um, but it illustrates the the challenges that we face as soon as we tip from not enough vaccine to not enough arms. Yeah, and it's coming. It'll be a month from now when that's that will be our new our new normal. Great, thank you. I'd like to thank the panelists, and I'd like to thank the audience for submitting their questions. And now, before we bring this event to a close, I'd like to turn it back over to Bob Walker for some final remarks. Well, uh, one 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 thing that Steph's answer about the mutants brought to mind was an analogy I heard recently that I kind of like, which is is uh, that of lowering a blanket onto a fire. That if you can put it down quickly, you put out the fire. If you put it down slowly, the, the, the blanket burns. So that's one that stuck with me. Uh, mainly, I just wanna thank the panelists uh, for their thoughtful responses and also thank the UCSF community for its, uh, this has been a year where it's been, there's nothing about it that's been joyful. But the fact that I, uh, you, you have a chance to see uh, how incredibly smart, committed, soulful, passionate people I have the opportunity to work with is really, uh, it's been quite, quite wonderful to be part of this community. I want to thank all of you for participating in this. I've learned a ton from the kinds of questions that we've gotten uh, all year, in this, uh, and, and this, is, uh, this is no exception. Uh, you know, hopefully we are heading toward the end and the path forward will be something that is uh, positive and will come out of this um, scarred and with the memories of the people that we have lost and all the harm, uh, but also uh, better and stronger with more of a focus on uh, caring about each other and caring for each other and for issues uh, of equity. I think there are some good things that can come out of this and hopefully we will maximize the good and minimize the bad. Uh, and uh, I feel quite confident that uh, the UCSF community in the Bay Area has, uh, has done quite well in this, at least comparatively, and that if any place can do that, we will do that. So thank you all for attending tonight, and, uh, and, and please stay safe. Uh, uh, we're not there yet, so uh, uh, be well.